key system, the knowledge engineering environment, and we have uh, knowledge bases hooked uh, up to a control panel right here at the moment, and it's just a little uh, example to show you how we can hear... A, a control panel of what? Uh, this could be a control panel, say, to a nuclear reactor okay. or to a, an instrument or uh, any other... Uh, kind of operational device that you would want to work with. And here, for example, we're just ex uh, changing the value of a meter and notice that it's generating a strip chart showing the time course behavior. Another thing we can do with these kinds of uh, panels is we can go in and look at uh, valves and we can affect the valve whether it's open or shut. Now what's important about this is this is affecting an underlying knowledge base which will then apply heuristics and decision making procedures to the system. Can but you show us that how you can go to the, the, the part, there you go, we sure. solve a problem. Well what we see underneath here now is a knowledge base for a nuclear reactor and we can have a representation of the components of the nuclear reactor as well as a representation of the uh, decision-making behavior that would be carried out by the expert. And when, what you will see here is that it's both possible to use rule-based reasoning as well as representation of the underlying knowledge. One of the first things we'll do here is just take a look at uh, how we could test the hypotheses of, of a particular accident situation and we just point to test hypotheses and activate it here and what we see the system doing is going through a decision making process where it's accessing the underlying knowledge base looking at the various states of the components and by the way the states of these particular components can be accessed directly into the instrument or to, into the nuclear reactor. Okay, now you can actually interrogate the system and ask it what course of logic is it following, is that correct? That's right, right now it's come up and asked the operator a question, is, this, is it true that the steam generator level is, is decreasing? So we can say why is this being asked and it will explain to us that it's doing it in order to prove that the steam generator inventory is inadequate. We will then give it an answer and it goes on to reach a conclusion. Okay, Tom, this system runs in LISP. Why is LISP the right language for an AI application? Well, one of the reasons that LISP is so important is that you need to have very powerful symbol manipulating capabilities. Decision making is primarily a symbolic activity. Knowledge representation is primarily symbolic and you need that kind of capability. Okay, thank you. Herb. John McCarthy has joined us. John is a professor of computer science at Stanford University and one of the pioneers in the field of artificial intelligence. Among his other accomplishments, he invented LISP, the language that Stuart just referred to. John, why did you invent LISP? Well, for artificial intelligence work, uh, the kind of thing that they are doing here. What are its characteristics that make it different than some other language uh, as applied to artificial intelligence? Besides the ones that Tom mentioned, uh, one of its important characteristics is that its programs and data are in the same format as its data so that it is easy to make programs that uh, produce programs and uh, look at programs. So it allows us to deal with facts and logic uh, m more than, than numbers. That's correct. I, I guess it's uh, on everyone's mind when we talk about smart machines. How smart can machines become? What are, what are the limits of, of uh, artificial intelligence? Well, I see no limit short of uh, human intelligence, and uh, then with faster machines, one could uh, do the equivalent that a human could do in a short time in a very long time. Niels, what's your thought on that? Where, how far can we go with this? Well, I'd uh, separate some of the problems that we're facing in order to make machines more uh, intelligent into about three different uh, varieties. We've heard a lot about how important knowledge is, and uh, one of the important things about knowledge is what knowledge should be represented in a program. And uh, some of the difficulties that we're having in making programs smarter is that we're not sure exactly what it is we want to tell those programs about certain subjects. Another category is once we figure that out, how do we represent the knowledge in the computer itself? And certain kinds of knowledge is proving a little difficult for us to represent it. The third category has to do with how that knowledge is used. And uh, certainly there's um, various activities there that have been rather successful, but other things that, uh, that really have to be done yet. Is there uh, a frustration level in this field uh, in that there, there's a lot of hope of what you can do with something like AI, but yet, as, as you've pointed out, Niels, it seems harder perhaps than one thought to really put this into a practical application? John? Well, uh, I th not, there is a certain level of, technolo uh, of technology in artificial intelligence today, and uh, many people are making applications based on this technology. Uh, on the other hand, 
uh, something that Niels said earlier uh, rises, uh, rouses a thought in me. Um, he said that we can put in the knowledge of a world-class expert, and that's indeed true. We can put in the knowledge of a world-class expert, provided it fits into the format that the present programs allow, namely of the kind, if this is true, uh, then do that. But uh, more general kinds of knowledge that are used in a sort of vaguer way are sometimes harder to put in. Say, uh, in the medical diagnosis era, at the beginning of the program, we had a simple example of medical diagnosis. Uh, there were several systems developed, and yet there were, were problems, in fact, in using that. What were those problems? Well, uh, I'm not sure what were the problems of those specific systems. Uh, however, to take a medical example, one can say, make a definition that a container is sterile um, if all the bacteria in it are dead. Uh, however, this piece of knowledge is not used in a special way to determine whether a uh, container is sterile by examining each of the bacteria. It's used as part of more general facts, like if you heat the container enough, then the bacteria will be all killed, and the fact that if the container is not sterile and you empty it out onto a culture medium, then you'll get uh, colonies of bacteria. And the still further fact is important that if you leave the bacteria in food, uh, then they will spoil it. Niels, where do you see the future practically going in AI? What's the biggest potential market, if you will, for these kinds of applications? Well, it seems to me that expert systems, as they have been going along, probably represents a rather large market. And we'll continue to develop uh, systems that are less brittle uh, over the next 5, 10, 15 years. Another uh, very important application is uh, computer programs that are able to converse with humans in English, uh, everyday ordinary language and uh, that's going to make computers accessible to a much wider variety of people. We have just about a minute. I like your phrase, brittle. Explain more what you mean by a brittle system. Well, it has to do with uh, being able to reason about the context, I think, in which a particular discussion or uh, conversation with the expert system is taking place. If the information that's needed to reach a certain conclusion is there and is there explicitly, then the system is usually able to come up with some reasonable answer. If it has to have what you might call common sense knowledge, knowledge that all of us learn by the time we're 10 or 15, uh, then it has a good deal more difficulty and, in a matter of fact, fails in many of those cases. So, ironically, common sense is the most difficult thing. There's very few people uh, who are willing to pay for putting common sense knowledge into a computer, whereas uh, it is interesting and uh, commercially important to put knowledge about a nuclear reactor into a computer. Okay, gentlemen, we're out of time. Thanks very much for being here. Thank you for joining us on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. programming tools for software development is pleased to provide major funding for the Computer Chronicles, the story of this continuing evolution. Random Access is made possible by a grant from Popular Computing, a McGraw-Hill magazine. I'm Susan Bimba, sitting in for Stuart Chaffe. In the Random Access file this week, the Commerce Department has made a move to stop the export of technology to countries allied with the Soviet Union, hitting the Digital Equipment Corporation with tough new restrictions on its exporting practices. Now DEC has to get individual export licenses for each sophisticated computer. It ships to West Germany, Austria, or Norway. Government officials say in these countries, computers can be easily diverted to the Eastern Bloc countries. Several months ago, one of DEC's computers was intercepted en route to the Soviet Union, but the company was found to be blameless in the incident.
Despite a strong lobby by the high-tech industry, President Reagan has given the Pentagon power to advise the Commerce Department on computer and high-tech exports to all foreign countries. The Pentagon already had the right to advise about applications for exports to communist countries. The Pentagon feels its input would help cut down on the number of computers that get diverted from non-communist countries to communist ones. The National Semiconductor Corporation could be banned from making chips for government projects. Early this month, the company admitted that over a three-year period, it inadequately tested chips that were used on many military projects. Now the Defense Logistic Agency is investigating National Semi, trying to find out exactly who's responsible for lying to the government about the testing. Despite these problems, National Semiconductor is reporting a profit of $15.4 million for the quarter ending March 4th. IBM is reporting big demand for its little computers. The company says this year its shipments of the PC will be triple what it was last year. It's estimated that IBM will ship more than 2 million of its PCs, PC Juniors, and other desktop IBM computers combined. And now that IBM is making its own portable computer, it looks as if Compaq, a maker of IBM-compatible portables, will be lowering its prices. So far, no date has been given for the price cut, but industry insiders say it will probably be around the beginning of April. Right now, the Compaq portable sells for $2,995. That's $200 more than the IBM portable. With a projected $500 cut, the Compaq will sell for $300 less than the IBM portable. Atari Incorporated is making cuts, but it will be employee cuts. The video game maker says it plans to lay off about 300 workers. At the same time, an Atari spokesman says there are plans to expand the sales and engineering staffs by about 100. Last year, the company lost over $500 million, laid off more than 2,000 of its Bay Area workers, and moved part of its operation to Taiwan and Hong Kong. Well, last week we told you the Japanese Trade Ministry may introduce a bill that would reduce protection of U.S. software in Japan. This week, the U.S. government is warning that if Japan's parliament ratifies the bill, the U.S. will retaliate in kind. If approved, the bill would limit copyright protection to U.S.-made software, making it necessary for U.S. software owners to license their programs to Japanese makers. Well, a little closer to home, our software reviewer, Paul Schindler, has some information for blackjack buffs who don't have money to burn. If you gamble in Nevada or Atlantic City, that's a familiar sight, the shuffling of blackjack cards, usually accompanied by the sight of your money being swept in by the dealer at the end of the round. Well, if you're tired of losing, there's a computer program for you. It's Ken Houston's Professional Blackjack. Now, it's pretty rare when the writer gets top billing when they name a computer program, but Houston deserves it. He's a former official of the Pacific Stock Exchange, and now he's a full-time gambler. Of course, some people would say that isn't much of a switch, but anyway, on a recent trip to Las Vegas, Houston was kicked out of five casinos after winning more than $3,000. Now, most computer blackjack games will just play blackjack with you. But the Whole Earth Software Catalog and Review says Houston's professional blackjack will teach you how to play the game and win using various point counting methods. The graphics are crisp, the table is green, the cards realistic looking, and the sound is good too. You can hear the cards hitting the table. Another use of sound, the program advises you on betting and card play and it beeps at you when you goof. Ken Houston's Professional Blackjack is $70 from Screenplay in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. For Random Access, I'm Paul Schindler. Next week, Paul reviews Volkswriter Deluxe, and that's it for this week's Random Access. I'm Susan Bimba. Random Access is made possible by a grant from Popular Computing, a McGraw-Hill magazine.